Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to another in the Nautel Transmission Talk Tuesday webinar series. This is, I think, and I'm throwing a dart at the board here, number 25. Might be 26. Sooner or later, I'll have to count them and write it down. I'll put a big post-it note up on the screen so I can forget to look at it, and we'll play the guessing game all over again. I'm your host, Jeff Welton, and today... I've got two really special guests. I've got some good friends on. Uh, we've got uh, the VP and General Manager of Brian Broadcasting down in uh, the great state of Texas, Ben Downs. Ben, welcome, and thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you very much. I have hit the hit the share button, and I think we're all there now. You're and good to go. Way, on, the, on, the, on the front screen, I just want to thank you very much for using my high school prom photo again. That's very, that's much better than what, what we have currently. I, I'm not sure where my lumberjack photo came from, but uh, at, at some point uh, that beard got a little bit longer, not much than that. Um, mm -hmm. Also joining us from uh, the great state of, uh, depending which side of the river he's sitting on today, either Minnesota or Wisconsin, we've got uh, Greg Borgen, the president of WDGY and WREY. Greg, welcome and thanks for joining us. Morning. So so which side of the river are you sitting on? Because uh, your stations are in Hudson. You're just over the uh, the Wisconsin state line. I am in the Minnesota side. There you go. Excellent. <laughs> So then uh, William Harrison made a note that he got his swag bag, and that uh, leads me to another note. The, the hidden and most important member of our crew uh, is uh, our own Mr. Disembodied Voice himself, Edward Sylvester. Ed's the guy that uh, herds the cats and makes us all look good. And uh, at some point, you're going to see a photo with Ed's title beside it. The photo won't be of Ed. So if you're new to us, whoever guesses who it is first will get a swag bag. We try to uh, limit the number of winners, so if you've uh, already won before, you can still guess, but I'll probably pick somebody else. No offense intended. Um, uh, the radio stations have a term for the people that win a whole bunch of times. I'm not even going down that road right now. So, guys, we're going to talk a well. We're going to talk a little bit about AM because that's uh, where where y'all mostly uh, have your bread and butter. Although FM factors into it today. Oh, the, our sales guy Jeff Wilson's throwing a guess at uh, who it's going to be, and uh, I can already tell him he's wrong. Um, before we get rolling, there are a few housekeeping notes. Again, if you're new to this, uh, we try to make these as interactive as we can. So you can see I'm addressing questions and comments already. You've got the little uh, question window on your control panel. By all means, feel free to type in question, comments, criticisms, concerns. We'll handle it all as we see it. If you'd uh, rather unmute your mic and become part of the conversation, there's a little hand wavy icon up there on your screen. You click on that. And uh, when I see that, then at whatever appears to be a convenient point, I'll unmute your mic and bring you into the conversation. Unless I think you're like Mr. Wilson, a troublemaker, and then I won't unmute your mic. I'll just talk about you and uh, leave you muted. What's well, a lot more fun that way. Remember, if you are an SBE member, these webinars do qualify for uh, half a certification credit for your recertification. If you're an SBE member and you're not certified, why not? Take care of it. It's easy to do. And uh, hey, it's good street cred. Gives you bragging rights, if nothing else. Uh, I see Wayne Piscina, the president of the SBEs in the audience today, too. And uh, Wayne is uh, not too far up the road from you, Ben. Oh, no. That means I've got to be right when I say something. Uh, <laughs> let's face nothing, it, Wayne knows all of this. All of this. Nothing worse than uh, throwing the bar up high early on the game. So the agenda, we'll skip right past this agenda screen. At some point, I'll take it out. I just have never bothered. But uh, this is basically how we, we work it. Uh, everybody becomes part of the conversation. We try to do it more like a chat around the coffee table than a uh, formal lecture. You don't need me talking at you when you can uh, you know, share share your thoughts as well. So, like I said, primarily we're going to focus on AM. Uh, that said, these days, AM and FM are becoming a lot more intertwined with, with translators. And, and Greg, uh, I'm going to pick on you for a bit uh, because you're in that unique position of uh, just about being able to hit the whole Minneapolis-St. Paul area with your AM signal. And, and you've got a couple of translators to fill in the gaps, yeah? Yes, we do. Yeah, we and sure how, How's the listenership on the, the translators versus the AM? Because you also have a music format, don't you? Yeah, we do. We do uh, 60s and 70s, uh, classic uh, oldies. And um, 
you know, it's working well. And it was working well on AM, which when you guys were in town, we, you know, you uh, kind of experienced the format and we're probably one of the, you know, there, there's not, there wasn't that many music stations on AM. Everybody was doing a lot of talk and we kind of went with that, uh, you know, the classic oldies and uh, it served us well. And it was uh, well to get the uh, AMHD going uh, with that, to have a little bit of uh, boost, uh, you know, something to talk about, keep the AM going. And, and, uh, and then now we've added the, these couple of FM translators, uh, you know, one at our tower site and then one in uh, downtown St. Paul. And it's been, that's been good too, you know, so to try to break it out, we have no idea where, you know, the audience is. But the one thing for our station is being an AM daytimer in the northern climate. It helps us uh, immensely with 24 7. You know, dead of summer with the AM, it's great. You know, we're on from right. 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., you know, for a bunch of months. But now in this winter month, uh, you know, it's 8 to 4. It's pretty mm -hmm. tough from an AM yeah. standpoint. So the uh, FM and is that good. You need to fill in the gaps, yeah. And uh, Ben, you don't have that so much uh, on a daytime down there because daytime down Texas, you're pretty much 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. anyway, yeah? No, no, we're signing off right now at 5.30 um, uh, Central Time. You know, and that's that's one of the reasons why we uh, started waving the flag around when there was a discussion about, um, about day, year round daylight saving time. Uh, it, it's originally the, the senators in Florida are the ones who are in favor of it and all. And, you know, it makes sense for them because, you know, they've got the, the amusement parks down there and all and more daylight makes, you know, it, it, it's good for them to have more daylight in the, in the afternoon. However, in broadcasting, if you're a daytime station, um, we, in our particular case, we have one of our stations as a daytimer. We have 11 brands here, nine, nine stations, and uh, one of them is a daytimer, and it wouldn't be signing on until 8.30 in the morning if we were to go at this time of year, if we were to go to uh, year-round daylight saving time. Nobody realizes that for two reasons. One, it involves math because you have to add an hour, <laughs> and two, because uh, it's a.m., and um, you know, I, I think Greg and I are some days the only people in America who are uh, who are actually in love with AM radio, I and mean, somebody's got to love it. But that's that's why I, it's something that we really all need to watch uh, if we're doing AM date timing, uh, especially if you know you've got peanut power like 25 watts or something like that at night. And there are a lot of us. Um, what is it like 4,800 AM stations? I, one day I did it and did the count. And um, there are 850 stations with less than 20, 25 watts or less uh, in, in nighttime or in pre-sunrise times. And that's, that's a lot of stations that would be affected by something like this. So, yeah, you know, see, you know uh, AM right needs a hug every now and again. Yeah, it does. And, and right on the bat, I think that's uh, where I need to prompt any of our... Um, marketing and engineering guys who are listening it's like you know there there's a market for a sub uh, 500 watt uh, am transmitter and, and nobody's really building one uh, this is not the first time you guys have hung out together to talk about something similar to this this is a uh, photo from the nab spring show back when we were all allowed to meet each other in person in uh, 2015 i think it was an am revitalization panel and I, I see yeah. Ben at the podium and Greg in the in the audience. And and Greg, uh, the, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, have have we moved the stick any further forward in the last five years? Well, I, I, you know, somewhat I think you know with uh, with you know, with the you know the AM revitalization that the uh, you know the translators has been a huge huge you know boon for the AM. Um, and as far as the HD. Um, you know, we, you know, we're back, you know, broadcasting and, you know, and HD, um, it seems to have a little bit of left there with high quality, you know, AM digital sound. It's phenomenal. So uh, I think that we are moving it forward, but we got to keep, you know, keep doing what we can do, I guess, to, you know, keep, keep AM going. Right. Yeah. I remember, and, and I remember that session that was one of the last times where the terms of our probation allowed us to be in the same room together greg that was <laughs> exactly. uh, those were good days weren't they <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely 
Those darned restraining orders, they'll get you every time. I th- we were talking earlier about I haven't been in Texas near as much these days, but uh, hopefully there's a statute of limitations. We'll find out. Uh, this is See, this is what happens when they move me from service into sales. Things get a little crazier. Uh, one of the other things, Greg, that uh, you and I got to play with uh, back in the day was the uh, all-digital AM testing. And this goes back again, 2014, 2015. Uh, in the same basic uh, time frame, and uh, go figure. It seems like I'm always the guy holding the camera. There's probably a reason for that. I think somebody's setting me up. But um, you know, the, and I showed a similar picture. We had David Layer on last week, and uh, we were talking about about these tests. And uh, we spent uh, what? How long were we there? Two or three days. We were running back and forth. Yeah, I think so. Three, four days, maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> and. Uh, yeah, David uh, put the uh, the comment up that uh, he had thought he had a picture of me standing in the uh, in in the door of your transmitter building, and I allowed us back then. I would have had a cigarette in my hand, but uh, oh, it's been what to be two years come January that I quit smoking. So it's it's been more than a week or two ago. There you um, go. Now, one of the other things that folks do talk about, and Ben. Ben very cheerfully told me, and oh, uh, David McKenzie was the one that noticed that Mr. Disembodied Voices picture was Danny Bonaducci. That's an old uh, Partridge family picture there. So uh, good, good call there, David. We'll reach out and get the contact info to get you swag kit. Um, but uh, Ben was saying that uh, you had to learn to uh, speak engineer a little bit not too long ago to uh, address the uh, bandwidth differences between the analog, the MA1, and the MA3. Well, if you do, you know, you, you take a look at the at the MA1 uh, that you had on the screen just micro moments ago. Look how that's that's a complex waveform, friends. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff there that makes the um, uh, that, that makes it work. We have we have an MA1 on uh, on WTAW a sixteen twenty using an Autel XR transmitter. Um, and to, we honestly, we've, we turned off the green down there at the bottom, the tertiary, because we could hear it a little bit on the air if we put on headphones. But when you look at the, when you look at the waveform for the, uh, uh, for the MA3, it's just cleaner. It, um, it, it takes a little explanation for people to understand that it doesn't occupy that as much bandwidth, uh, the, you know the comment sections. The first thing anybody always says about HD radio is it uh, you know makes noise on your neighbors and all this kind of stuff. And there are clever little things about it, but it's uh, you, and you can see it goes out there. It's it's 30 kilohertz, but it's not that big if it's uh, the all digital. That brings it right back into the to the 20 kilohertz like God in the FCC intended back at the start. And um, you know the the analog isn't there but there's a there's a really nice digital there now you and i were talking and you were breaking my heart earlier when you said that my xr and my exporter plus needed to have needed to have an upgrade uh to do uh hd the ma3 version that's the 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 orange there that the exporter plus surely does that it is that uh is that Nautel's theory on this or how does that how is that work so it, it varies by system, and I know Greg's got uh, that's an XR3 that you've got that we were doing the testing on, yeah? Six. Six, okay, thank you. And uh, on that one, we did load the MA3 code into the Exporter Plus. So it, it was possible. What we didn't really spend a lot of time looking at was mass clearance. Uh, so I'm not, I, I can't guarantee that. But uh, we are doing some testing on it at the moment. Um, the HD multicast handles MA3, but doesn't handle MA1. So, you know, it, it is kind of a, a moving target at the moment as to what they will support and what they won't. And uh, some of it needs folks like you to come back and say, hey, we need this uh, Exporter Plus to do MA3, even if it's just core mode. Uh, the enhanced mode, the uh, when you add the secondary, the tertiary carriers, the blue on the screen, for that you need the HD multicast because at that point you need the importer functions for the artist song title, the data data functions. 
So I, I, I hope that answered it, Ben, a little bit. Um, in, in a nutshell, uh, what, what you need to do is reach out to your, your sales guy and, and say, hey. Whoever uh, that might be in the central time zone, right? Well, for you, that would be Jeff Wilson, who is listening right now. So, Jeff, jot yourself a note to call Ben and say, "Hey, what do you need to? Do? What do we need to do to get this thing going for you?" I just um, want to be able to play Christmas music some night at midnight, experimentally, and see what happens. That's what I want. Now, and that was one of the things that you'll want to play with a little bit because, uh, Greg, when we did the drive testing for you. Um, one of the things that uh, we noted was um, if you look at the 694, 494 loop around Minneapolis, St. Paul, in hybrid MA1, where the uh, digital carriers, of course, are 20 dB down, you were, uh, you were having a lot of dropouts and reverting to analog over a, about half of that loop. But uh, you got a lot better coverage when we went to all digital. It, it was solid, 494, 694 ring around the metro yeah now is is and, and i'm, I'm going to kind of put you both on the spot a little bit here and there but have you got any thought toward um putting dgy especially where you've got the the translators now for the fm or have you had any thoughts about putting it to all hd we have um you know we'll just have to kind of see what uh you know what happens down the line a little bit maybe there's an opportunity to acquire something or to maybe just make a jump into it but uh, you know um, we're definitely looking at it because it's uh, uh, it would be something unique and something to talk about and hopefully there's a you know look at it from a sales standpoint or sales opportunity uh, right. because it is wall-to-wall uh, -wall coverage over the metro and even with uh, portable HD radios that we had in and around spot homes and, and testing as we did Mm -hmm. you well, know, there's kind of a there's a, a a chart where some of this makes sense and some of it doesn't. Um, we have one uh, that really makes perfect sense. All of the listening is carried on the translator. Uh, the AM uh, it's 1500 watts a day and almost nothing at night but it's 1500 watts a day and the AM really has no listenership to speak of. It's all on the FM and uh, on the translator. And we plan on taking that one um, uh, HD MA3 as soon as, as soon as we can. Uh, it's, you know, it, it would be, we would be able to do it a little quicker if the economy hadn't crashed. I, I don't know if uh, up in Canada, you guys have noticed, but there's some kind of pandemic or something that's going around that uh, seems to slow business down a little bit. But it, for us, that it, it makes all the sense in the world to try to do that. And it's a music format, which is, um, you know, I have on my notes to give Jeff trouble about the article you wrote where you said that you thought it was all programming was the reason that AM was having problems. And of course, I'm overstating it because it's easier to make a point that way. But, uh, Are you picking on me? No, no, no Jeff, was, Jeff was saying that, oh, it's all programming. That's why AM uh, isn't as popular as it used to be. But, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. Everyone can be wrong once. But anyway, uh, we have we have that one. Yeah, we have that one that we plan to do uh, MA3 on, because you know why not? We have nothing to lose, and that's kind of where this comes from. Uh, all all the guys who hit the comment boards and say, well, you know, DAB is uh, should have been what we did here and all. And I know Nautel has DAB product, but it I just we have 70 million car radios right now that pick up the HD signal, that pick up the MA3 uh, version of Nautel and everybody else's digital signal. 70 million, and it's taken us forever to get there. And you know, DAB has pros and cons, but I just don't want to flush all of those receivers and start over because there are 0.0, .0 in the United States right now. I think Dave Colasar said it best at WWFD, you know, that, um, you know, where they've been running digital. It's do you, if, if you go all digital on your AM, every day you can actually pick up, there's more radios that come out that pick up your signal. 
there are more people who can pick up the all digital more and more with every day. And can you say that about listeners on a on straight up AM? You know, I I would argue that we're not going we're not going in an up direction with AM listenership. I would argue that we're trying to hold steady with what we've got. And you know, would you rather take a chance with the 40 or 50 percent of the people who can pick it up in their cars or with the 10 to 15 percent of people who listen to am it's you know i've got them everybody everybody has you know an am here and there but i think that that's that's really the decision tree that you have to bring into play do you want to do you want to take a chance do you want to be able to put music back on the air on your station and not have any problem with competing? You can't you can't compete with a class. If there's a class C2 mark station in the market that's playing pop, you're not going to be able to compete with uh, an AM station. It's just really difficult. You're, you'll find yourself in a niche format or you'll find yourself just, you know, going to talk, which is the easy uh, the easy choice to make but with this with ma3 you'll be able to compete on an equal footing i think with uh, an fm station you know the only difference is is you're just going to have to slowly but surely wait until the uh, wait until the numbers continue to grow on the number of uh receivers that have penetrated the market now, one of the things I kind of threw it out there at uh, David Lair last week and, and kind of put him on the spot. Uh, and, and so now I'm going to ask you two what you think. Um, but uh, so what about... Well, well I was someone... going to say, you know, from, from, okay. you know, looking at the map there from my particular standpoint is that, you know, I, we have a very, very strong um, signal, you know, with AM. And in the hybrid mode, it... it performs and allows all the features of the HD to come through. With our particular station, if you look at the maps, you can see, you know, our city of license is Hudson. You know, we have a translator that covers, you know, a little bit of that, you know, Hudson Stillwater market. And then our other translator is, you know, basically uh, around St. Paul. So, you know, we're, you know, 15 miles of coverage on each one of those, but yet our signal goes way past that. And we just haven't you know, been able to really figure out, you know, one, if we make the jump to all digital or if we stay in the, in this mode. And, you know, I think that, you know, at some point we may make that decision to make it all, you know, jump to digital, but it would really be, you know, a lot easier from a standpoint if we could find another AM facility and then have analog and, and digital going back and forth and see where the true, um, and, you know, what... And that would happen and, in the past. In my your particular case, case, if we had, if I only had a thousand watt, um, you know, day timer, you know, or 500 watt day timer, I might be the first one in the country to jump, you know, would have been the first one in the country to jump to all digital just to, you know, try to make that, that move going forward. But right now it's kind of in a financial, you know, situation. What do we do? You know, it's just kind of holding everything together because of that little thing called COVID. Well, you know, that was your particular situation and well, everybody's situation really was one of the reasons that the word voluntary was in there on the uh, notice of proposed rulemaking from our no proposed rulemaking that we filed for. That's been in there from the very start because right. there are some people, it just doesn't make sense to convert. Um, I question whether a, a a pure day timer, you know, sign on, sign off, no pre-sunrise, nothing like that. I question whether that makes financial sense for that station. And also, if you um, if you have, uh, I have a station that's number one in the market, and uh, it it's you know 10,000 watts, and it covers a lot more territory than the translator would. I think I, I I'm not inclined to want to flush. Uh, that analog listenership that I have, but for a lot of people, it it makes sense. But if it doesn't, we're not going to back a pickup truck up and take your transmitter away from you. Uh, it's just um, it 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 does make sense for some. It doesn't for others. Right. You know, one of the, one of the things I was talking to 
uh, one of the managers down in, in Houston that has a troubled AM station. And uh, what, what was said to me was, um, I, I like the whole translator thing, but we can't get a translator down here in Houston. There's no spectrum available for it. So what have you got for me? Well, there, there's not a lot. Uh, we can't clean up the AM band and we just, you know, we do what we can with it. But this, I guess, if you have a troubled AM and you have no other, no other, pro, no other pathway to clean it up and no other pathway to make it competitive and somebody else is already doing sports or in the case of Houston, three other people are already doing sports, then, um, you know, maybe this makes a lot of sense right. to find something up that's music. Right that you can do with MA3 that you couldn't do with straight eight analog and, um, you know, try to compete with it. Right. And well, and that's, so, the, that's, well, that's why it's voluntary. One of the things that I, uh, I, I always say, and you, you made this mention earlier is, uh, I spend probably more time on social media than I should. And, and one should never, ever, ever, ever read the comments. And that way I, lies madness, Jeff. Don't do it. Yeah. Well, that does explain a whole lot there, right there. But uh, when you think about it, uh, for all intents, FM really started to become viable as a broadcast medium around about 1950-51. I mean, yeah, it was being tested before then, but it wasn't until about 50-51 after World War II when they switched to the 88-108 to band. And even then, it was 1976, 25 years later, before FM passed AM in listenership. So here we are, HD in generally started 2004, 2005, 15 years ago. So we've still got about another 10 years to go at a guess. You know, so will it ever pass uh, can, analog? Maybe, maybe it won't. I don't know. But I, I like what you said about uh, about it being voluntary and, and look at your own situation. Um, you know, I was uh, tossing with, with David Lair last week. I, I kind of poked fun and, and this was something I kind of wanted to get your guys take on but what about in the future if you got in your car and all you had on your car radio was a, a set of little icons and one of them said WDGY and you hit WDGY and you don't know whether you're listening to AM or FM because the sound quality is about the same either way and it doesn't specify it just shows the icon so you know would that help bring folks back to AM if they didn't actually know it was AM well, having having presets has always been one of the best, uh, most beneficial things to help AM out. Um, I know in my Toyota, it doesn't say AM or FM. It just gets the frequency up there and you punch the button and, you know, it, it does all the other stuff itself. The other the other piece of the puzzle is um, are, are these hybrid connected uh, radios, which, you know, are are sitting there uh, in the market some of the german auto manufacturers are including those so that when you punch the button you're actually going to a digital signal and that's something you know that that's what really kind of got to me a little bit is when first of all when am radios uh, was it tesla or, or porsche that took the am radios out of the cars because it was too electronic uh, cars because it was too noisy and and then, um, and then we had this the connected cars come up and trying to compete with an AM analog signal against a, a digital and, and FM HD signal, and you know where it's all the same on the dashboard. The car doesn't care. It, I just felt like this was a tool that was being denied to us that we needed to exercise the tool. It needed to be there, and an option is the best way to do something like that. Now, I'm going to throw you both on the spot again. So a, a couple, three weeks ago, I guess, uh, Jeff and Donna Detweiler were, were on, and we were talking about digital. And Donna, of course, handles the licensing for Xbury these days. And she mentioned that at the moment, at least, uh, Xbury is waiving the license fee for MA3, and there's no specific requirement to build it out in any time frame. So have you guys both applied for the MA3 license? Two of them. There you go. Greg? You go In the process. In the process. You go. And I, I, I told, I'd say, 
I tell all my friends that it's the best deal around because there's no expiration date. And I should point out I already have one license, so that yeah. uh, that almost builds me out. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what I say. It, it, if it doesn't cost anything now and it, uh, it it's valid for for the foreseeable future, at least, then it, it makes no sense not to get it for your AMs. And then if you do decide, then it's there. And uh, if they decide not to waive the fee anymore at some point, you're already in place. So uh, yep. that was, uh, that's my little tip for the day, so to speak. I'll, so we um, had you guys together on the uh, AM revitalization board. And then the fall of the same year, you were, um, sort of sitting at the same table again. Seems like uh, there, there's a, a little bit of a, a pattern occurring here. Um, now, this one was after the all digital uh, testing was done. And uh, I know Andy Scott, all I, I was at his site. Uh, ben, I didn't get to play with any of yours, but everybody else in this uh, cast of characters I, I've uh, hung around with. So uh, what, uh, what were the takeaways from the all digital testing five years ago? I mean, obviously I'm assuming that's kind of what led to uh, to this slide with the NPRM, is that about right? Well, we had, you know, David Layer had put tons of work into it. And so, and everybody, uh, everybody, including Nautel, had done a lot of work with WWFD. And uh, the, the truth is I was, I was sitting on my back, my back, my back porch, I have AMs and FMs, but I was sitting on the back porch having a glass of wine and it occurred to me that you know, we've, we've proved this. We have, a, we have a proof of concept. It works. It works better than the MA1, and it works better than just analog. Why can't we use it? And so that's why I jumped in and, uh, you know, spent, spent a few legal dollars here and there, talked to some people at the FCC, and um, no, no one really was against it. The, um, I, I let a few people know that this was coming up and so we got some really nice comments uh we got the usual compliment of crazy comments but we we got many nice comments from broadcasters who may not be planning on doing it but just wanted the opportunity to do it if they if you know five years from now if it made sense and that's really why we did and you know the given covid and given everything else the the fcc i think moved really fast with this because it was you know it was really building a whole new service the digital service has um has, has different rules for power and modulation and everything so it's uh they they did a very fine job getting this knocked out i think at a, at a record pace and that's uh, one of the things I was going to mention that for anybody who isn't aware, as of October 27th of this year, there was a report and order released authorizing MA3 transmission on a voluntary basis. It's not mandatory. We're not taking away your analog. Um, there, the, the, do you think we're going to stop some of the, no, the Facebook comments no. will still be there. But, no, we'll uh, be talking about razor blade radios 20 years from now. So the, the points to remember, and Ben, you did a really good job covering it before, is that the all digital does use a lot less bandwidth, channel bandwidth. Um, and that, that's pretty huge because it means that the first adjacent interference becomes less of a situation. You know, um, you know, Greg, uh, you're more uh, closer to a, a pretty big area. Did, was, uh, if you had any interference comments at all uh, with, with your 740? I mean, it, it's been running hybrid for a bit now. But Greg, I think no, you're muted. No, we never. Eric. Yeah, no, we have never. Uh, am I muted? No, you're good. You're good. It's a no, little laggy. Be, uh, not, not, he's not. Okay. Yeah. No, we have not received uh, none. No. Okay, good, good. So, uh, no complaints uh, at all. And that's been running hybrid. Uh, now, you guys, for a little bit, I know you had a, an exporter failure because the current goes through something sooner or later. Current will go stop going through it. And uh, you were running AM stereo, too, um, which is also built into the exporter. So what are your thoughts on AM stereo versus uh, versus MA1 versus hybrid HD? Well, I, I guarantee you that there's more HD radios than there are AM stereo radios out there today. <laughs> so that's uh, that's you know that speaks for itself. So 
but no, we, you know, so we had been running, you know, um, MA1 for years and years. And then, uh, you know, when the exporter, we just, you know, we toyed around with uh, AM stereo a little bit to, you know, see where that went and uh, tried to buy a few AM uh, Sony receiver, AM Sony receivers, and uh, it was hard to find those. And uh, so mm-hmm. we put the MA1 back into, uh, uh, into service and it's going along just fantastic so if you if you listen to the hybrid mode you'll say to yourself oh, okay this is magic this is this is oh, what exactly. am am should sound like because it's it's everything yeah. you know it, it's it is in stereo it is digital it doesn't um, the the only problem i've ever had with uh, running in our ma1 is that uh, and that's the hybrid mode i guess really if we ought to say hybrid instead of ma1 because that's actually english but uh the um uh in the hybrid mode you know it, it's fragile it will drop out and blend to analog and uh, you know it, it, it's fragile from a, a noise standpoint if there's a lot of noise it'll it could drop out and if you talk to glenn walden uh, the guy who designed the whole system, he's, I, I don't want to speak for him really, but I will. Uh, I think he's frustrated that it's taken this long because he always intended for the hybrid mode to be just a transition between a- analog and full digital. It was just something to kind of fill in the gaps. And, you know, it's become it's become really until now it's become really the only way that you could have digital on your am look the, the hybrid it was is fragile my understanding is that you guys have made the discovery that the all digital is not fragile that that sucker goes for a long way and actually extends your listenership your your coverage area beyond what you have for analog is, is am i that I understand right, isn't it? Especially That's, at night, isn't it? Didn't it go? Didn't it go further? That it, it it's somewhat situational, but for the most part, and, and this is again working mostly with what uh, Dave Collisar's found at WWFD. That in a lot of cases, the digital is going out to and is receivable out to near their 0.1 millivolt contour, so quite a bit beyond where the analog is useful. Um, so yeah, it, uh, it, it's at the very least, it's offering you parity and coverage. And, and for the most part, it, it's offering an improvement because when you get it, it's a, it's clean sound. It's, it's not filled with static and, you know, dealing with all the nonsense from computer power supplies and, you know, cell phone chargers and led traffic lights and all that great stuff. I mean, you plug so, in a uh, cell phone charger and you're not listening to the radio anymore. I mean, I, I know at my house, I, if it's an analog radio, uh, I have to make sure I don't charge on the same outlet. It just, you know, it has to be away. And mm-hmm. that's no way to go through life. And I mean, uh, there's there's a whole different argument as uh, as smaller AM operators, you know, I mean, power company and their uh, lack of... Uh, Responsiveness. I, I, Thank you. I, I don't want to call out the FCC for not enforcing something as foolish as a cracked insulator on a power line, but I mean, that's something that does have an impact on AM listening. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, I mean, and now is that something that over the years you've developed contacts at the power company where you can say that, or do you just kind of shrug your shoulders and say, I don't know, Greg, what do you, what do, you do in a case like that? We've never had any success uh, in speaking to the power company, unfortunately. Who, who do you, you know, who do you talk to? No one knows what you're calling about. The people at, with the power company will tell you, well, no, the, that's the pole. We just rent the transmission line, and the pole people will tell you it's someone else. And in the meantime, you've got a half a mile of a uh, of building of cascading noise along a power line as you drive down the highway. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that's always been an ongoing thing, but as the noise floor has increased steadily, I mean, we've got a paper on our website, but actually just looked it up the other day from 2009. Actually, I shouldn't say I looked it up. Uh, I'm pretty sure Ed found it for me because he's the genius that makes all this stuff happen for me. But uh, 
but yeah, that uh, showed that the noise floor has gone up very significantly over the past uh, 20, 30 years even. So, you know, oh, yeah. the stuff, you know, it, it comes back to why they uh, narrowed the bandwidth on the receivers and why they don't sound nearly as good as they did in the 50s and 60s. No, I had, uh, I made presentation to the, to the NAB. I was, I, I was on, or I may have been the AM revitalization committee. I, I was on the committee and all I could find at the time was something from the IEEE uh, that, did, that did a study in Mexico City and did it in Madrid. And I, I found my notes from that last night and um, the noise floor from 1970 to 1999 had gone up 40 dB in Mexico City. And, you know, it's not hard to believe, but, you know, what's that 10 times? Is that the math on that 10 times? The, you'd have to increase your, you'd have to increase your power on your transmitter 10 times to, or more to, to have the same signal to noise ratio that you had in the 70s. I mean, that's not, well, that's not legit. Fortunately for us, we had a chairman at the FCC, a, a commissioner at first and a chairman now who likes AM radio and recognize the problem. And so, you know, he's got other things on his plate, but he was at least willing to take the meetings and take a listen to the solutions that we presented. And, you know, uh, the first solution we presented was to move off of AM and, and do the translator thing. But this one is, this solution is voluntary, and, but it is actually on the AM band. And it is actually a solution for the problem that we've been facing. Yep. And that uh, there's a, oh, it is uh, posted for anybody who's interested, the, uh, the link for the um, link for the uh, paper on the noise floor. Um, and Paul Meyer has uh, made a, um, made a comment about uh, over the air TV viewing suffers as well. I mean, basically we, we've created all this electrical noise and you're talking that study going to 1999. And, uh, you know, I started at Nautel in 1990. Um, we started using cell phones, like the more portable cell phones on a regular basis, 2000 to 2004 or five in that range. And that's when, so, you know, the 20 years since 1999, I'm willing to bet your noise floor has gone up another order of magnitude as we're all using these little USB charger devices, mm -hmm. you know, so definitely. And uh, I'm sure they all completely qualify under part 15, every single one of them as far as noise generation, right? Yeah, that, that sound you heard was my eyeballs clicking as they hit the top limit. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things you had talked about was uh, was range, and, and, uh, and this is one of the things Dave Collisar had a, a paper for NAB this year. And uh, of course, you, you get a paper for NAB, it's kind of a big deal, and then having to do it as a virtual scenario, that's a that's an interesting and a fun challenge, and I uh, I empathize with them on that. But uh, this is um, looking at the the constellation. Mm -hmm for a couple of different transmitters. And really what it's speaking to is, is crest factor reduction and uh, having sufficient PDM switching frequency. And that, that's all a bunch of engineering stuff to say that your transmitter also has an impact on how fast a receiver will lock in and how far your signal go. And it used to be in the analog days, you had a 10 kilowatt signal, 10 kilowatts was 10 kilowatts. And as long as your antenna was properly tuned, it would go pretty much the same distance, no matter what you used for a transmitter. And uh, these days, that's perhaps a little less the case. So that that's also something that folks need to sort of be aware of and pay some attention to. Uh, the one thing that we haven't touched, and, and Greg, you kind of left the door open for me, but I wanted to wait till we get to this slide. So I'm gonna bring you in on this one, but, uh, one of the things that you'd mentioned was if there was a potential, uh, I, I guess, well, obviously, if you don't have a business case for something, it makes no sense to invest money in doing it. And uh, one of the things that was played with at WWFD was an HD2 on AM. Um, now, would something like that, and again, of course, right now, there's not a receiver on the planet that can pick it up, but assuming that receivers could be, could be uh, produced, 
would would that be something that would uh, you know light light a fire under, and un, well you know under your business plan so to speak? I think most definitely. I mean that's uh, then I could take my other AM and put that on as a HD uh, two channel and maybe uh, just you know you know that that would be the impetus to vote, to move to an all digital uh, uh, MA three uh, situation. So uh, because we do run another. Uh, format on AM in the marketplace, and uh, it's an ethnic program, and I think it'd be uh, would serve itself well to have a all digital HD two channel if we could do that. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. And I mean, now right now, I know uh, I know that uh, there was a, a station in Indy that uh, that had put an application in and got approval for the HD two, but were told specifically they couldn't do it as to drive a translator. Now, having said that, that was number one, it was before um, MA3, before the report and order approving uh, all digital operation. And, and number two, obviously without any receivers, it's uh, hard to make the case. Right. But uh, the FCC did say in their decision, and they mentioned it again in the report and order that they would take those requests on a case by case basis. So if you've got an application where you think you could use an MA or an HD2, then potentially it's something to consider. Uh, Bob Trimble makes a good point here. They've had here, I'm gonna to have to read this. The hams here have had good luck with finding bad insulators by hooking a UHF Yagi to a spectrum analyzer, driving up and down the streets around their house when passing an arcing insulator, the S, uh, analyzer would really jump. Power company was a lot easier to deal with when you can call and give them an exact poll number to look at. And uh, that, that's true, but uh, I, I, so Ben, how much time do you have to run around looking for power poles that uh, have problems? Well, there, there are some places I would put the time in, but uh, mm -hmm. that's, that, you know, that sounds like a good idea to me. I mean, it's obviously well, going to be labor intensive. Well, and so there's something to think about though, and, and there's something for the, the rest of the broadcasters and engineers listening to is, uh, Sometimes for something like this, involving your local ham club might be the way, because to them it's a fox hunt. It's a fun little diversion that they're they're happy to go out and do, and it uh, gets a job done for you at the same time. Now, that's a good idea. Yeah. So now, Greg, I, I know I, I don't know about uh, Minneapolis exactly. I know St. Cloud's got a ham. I'm sure there's a ham club in Minneapolis. Either of you guys ham radio operators? I am not. Oh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, a broadcaster and nothing else. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I, I told people I all the ham I handle is just about like what you see right here. Broadcaster for life. So I'm going to throw up. This is uh, pretty much the last slide. And, and folks, you'll notice I've been kind of high speeding. Ben's got another commitment right sharp at the top of the hour, and we don't want to make him too late for that. But uh, this is the part where I throw it open and I've used this same slide. This is the third week in a row I've used this particular slide. Sooner or later, I'll get tired of looking at the cute little puppy pictures, but uh, compared to the rest of my Facebook feed, this is a whole lot more fun to pay attention to. Um, well, this, so, this and cats are why we invented the internet. Pretty much, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, so, on this, this is where I throw it up. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that, uh, Greg, anything we haven't touched on that you think that should be raised? You know, I, I, you know, I just think from a, from, you know, my particular standpoint, it's, uh, you know, we will be, you know, broadcasting um, in digital AM, MA3 at some point. It's just, a, you know, for sure we will be doing it. It's just a matter of when. Ben? Well, I think if you're going to be in, in this business, you've got to keep up with this business. Um, back in the 18th century, when I was starting out in broadcasting, I, um, I had a manager who had been, the, the station had been given an FM station, and he wanted to argue about whether or not it should be stereo or not. And, you know, I, I kind of sort of feel like that's, the argument we're having today. If you're gonna be in the business, you're gonna to need to take the steps to become competitive. There are people nipping at our heels every day. And if you are an analog AM station, and you 
can make the adjustment, then I, I think it's incumbent upon you to do it. Now, I know that there are situations where you can't. Like that decision tree branches off at a lot of different places. Um, I would I would really like for someone like Natel to, um, you know, give us, if you will, a, a decision tree on what your equipment is, on what my equipment is, and what I've got to do if I'm going to broadcast in MA3 all the way. There is, when we look at when we look at the um, the business of the uh, digital, the, the hybrid radios and all, there's there's a cost associated with that that we haven't really that I don't think many of us have considered, and that is that uh, you know for the radio to do the blending back and forth, it's going to have to be listening to your stream all the time, and I guarantee you that we're going to have to pay for that. Uh, we'll have to that'll be a performance that if there's a thousand radios out there and it's listening for your to your digital in order to blend back and forth you know that's a thousand performances so if there's a way that we can if there's a way that we can provide a product that that meets the needs of today's listeners that sounds great provides the audience experience experience the the album art, the song titles, the music title. If we can do something like that, I think that makes us competitive with these fancy and shiny new products that are looming on the horizon. Otherwise, it's easy to forget about us. Uh, we're AM radio, we're FM radio. We've been around so long, everybody knows about us, and it's easy to forget something that you just take for granted. Right. Oh, and uh, so Jeff Wilson's uh, making a, a, a plug to uh, please, please, please listen to what Ben's saying, uh, specifically with respect to what gear will do what. And uh, so this is where I put the plug in. And uh, since uh, our marketing director who kind of coordinates webinars hasn't said yes or no one way or the other, I'm, I'm going to hang the flag out there and say, yeah. Um, we are looking at a winter webinar series, and one of the topics I want to cover is what does what specifically, and what would be needed to get any piece up to whatever, whether it's going to uh, yep. core mode or, or full expanded mode. I, the, the groups, the broadcast groups that I'm in, the list serves and all that, when, when they know that I'm, you know, the guy who filed the petition for MA3, the, the question they all ask is, well, how much is this going to cost? And the answer is no one knows. And right. I think that that's something that Nautel could take a leadership role on and, and fix. It would be very nice if I could uh, tell them, well, if your tower's good, it's going to cost this much. If you've got a really old transmitter, it's going to cost this much. Or at least, if nothing else, show what steps have to be taken to become all digital ready because you know it's not everybody is not everybody has done a smith chart and has a rotation network stuck on their uh, on their right. am station but yeah you know. and i mean i know greg you've got mark mueller doing your engineering and, and there's a lot of time put into the uh the layout and you're only run i mean it's not an incredibly complex pattern you got a three tower directional with a couple of nulls so uh so yeah, I mean, there was a lot of time put into that, wasn't there? Yeah, very much so. But uh, you know, it's well worth it. It makes it uh, makes it stable and uh, you know runs and performs very very well. So right off the bat, there's there's a plug for winter webinar series. I'm not sure exactly when we are looking at doing it. Somewhere in January, I'm thinking. But uh, keep an eye out, and you should see something like that. Um, Let's see, I've got nothing else on those. One thing to note is that as with all of our webinars, this will be archived at some point. Uh, I'm really hoping it, uh, my, uh, my um, invisible voice uh, the, is uh, hitting the record button at the appropriate time because I totally forgot to, but that's not unusual. This is why I have Ed to keep me out of trouble. It says um, this session is being recorded. I mean, trust I'll, me, that's the first thing I'll notice. <laughs> I, I just try to make it a point not to say anything that I wouldn't want repeated back to me at some point. Um, working on the theory, what do they say? The mic's always live and the camera's always on. Um, yep. 
So absolutely, that's uh, that'll be there uh, either on our webinars link on our website or on the YouTube channel, which you can get to directly. Uh, Nautel Waves newsletter, you can get to that through the website. That also came out quite recently. I think there's another one scheduled for early in the year. Typically, we try not to spam your mailbox with them, so you get four or five a year, give or take, uh, basically whenever we think we've got something to say. On that note, folks, Miracle of Miracles were a minute or two early, but I want to say thank you all for attending. I want to give special thanks, Ben and Greg, for taking time out of your day. I, I know you both are really busy, and I really appreciate you joining in with us today. Thank you. Nautel, of course, is a is a go to uh, a go to manufacturer for this, and uh, we really appreciate the support over the years that Nautel has given AM radio. That's not everyone does that. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, uh, for and Nautel for you know putting the program together. And Ben, thanks for your uh, tireless, tireless efforts on behalf of AM broadcasters. Hey, I, I really Greg, you gave you gave him your radio station, Greg. All I did was file paper. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, folks, I want to thank you all very much for attending us with us uh, next week. I think we're going to flip over to FM. We've got uh, Sean Edwards from Shively. We're going to talk about serious engineering geek stuff, uh, filters and all that great stuff. And on that note, folks, I want to thank you all very much for joining us and we hope to see you next week. Have a great day. Merry Christmas. Christmas.